But the biggest question that really, really, really gets addressed when you hit this level is what do I know? What do I know? Okay, so you've had a really intense two weeks. You guys have been learning for around eight to nine hours a day. What I want to do here is try to give you a framework where you can digest a lot of the stuff that you learned. I call this presentation the evolution of consciousness. And what you're going to learn here is a map for understanding your personal growth. The reason I picked this particular presentation, and I'm doing it in this particular style, is because 50 years ago to this coming week, Literally, to this coming week, as in Monday tomorrow, something interesting happened. It was 1968, and on CBS television, a man called Alan Watts made one of his first appearances. That's what the footage looked like. It was CBS television, it was a program called Camera 3, and Alan Watts went on <laughs> with a group of students. What's the matter with this? <clears throat> to teach his unique nice. philosophy of Zen <laughs> to America. Now, in that program, Alan Watts asks people these three questions. He said, if you ponder these questions enough, it unlocks a lot of new meaning in your life. The questions are, who am I? What do I desire? And what do I know? Now, these questions sound simple enough, right? But it goes way deeper. Last week, I was with Alan's son, Mark Watts. It was me, the Mind Valley team, and Mark's team. We are working on a new quest with Alan Watts. And this quest goes deep into these questions plus two additional questions. But Mark explained to me why these questions were so profound. And these questions are why people today, hundreds of millions of people, love Alan Watts. Alan Watts stands in the house, raise your hand and make some noise. He's so influential, Volvo just used one of his talks in one of their advertisements. This was like six months ago. Now, the reason these questions are important, according to Mark Watts, is that there's a Sanskrit term called upaya. And upaya really means to get back in flow. So Mark explained it this way. He says, imagine in India, there's this wild river flowing, and the boatmen there know exactly where to aim their boat so that when they take off from their part of the, the bank, they can gently navigate through the flow of the river, through all the rocks and danger points, and hit the opposite bank. That is upaya. It's being pointed in the right direction, so that no matter how dangerous the rapids are, or whatever rocks come in the way, you end up going to where you want to go. And he said these five questions are like upaya for your soul, for your mind. When you truly, truly, truly reflect and answer these five Zen questions, no matter what crap comes your way, you know how to navigate that and get back to flow. You guys get me? Yes. So, now let's take what Alan Watts was speaking about and connect it with a model that you guys know as Mind Valley students. And that is the model from my book, The Code of the Extraordinary Mind, where I talk about the four different levels of evolution. Because as I was there listening to Mark, I realized that those three questions, you would answer them differently depending on where you are in this particular model of conscious evolution. So first, let me explain this model. This model basically says that at each level of your conscious evolution, you react to the world and shape the world in different ways. So let's go deeper, right? Many people in the world today, the majority of human beings exist at level one. They are living in what we call the culture scape. And at this level, the world happens to them. But at a certain point, people start questioning. They start waking up. They go to level two. I call that the awakening. This is where they realize that you can choose certain experiences in the world. Now, when you do that enough, you go to level three. Level three is called recoding yourself. This is where you realize that, wait a minute, the world isn't just outside you, the world is inside you as well. And you start paying attention to your inner world. As soon as you start going within, this opens you up to level four. And level four is where I say you really start becoming extraordinary. Level four is where an important shift happens 
that completely transforms how you live your life. And it puts you in perhaps what could be the one to 5% of human beings in the world today who are truly fulfilled, happy, and giving back. We'll explore that in a moment. First, let's look at the three questions, right? Who am I? What do I desire? What do I know? Who am I? What do I desire? What do I know? And in each of these levels, we're gonna ask these three questions. And I'm gonna show you a couple of things that connects what Alan said to modern science, modern philosophers, and many of our teachers here at Mind Valley. Let's start with level one, the culture scape. So the culture scape is that tangled web of rituals, of beliefs, of ideas that come from culture. Whether you live in a tribe in some developing part of the world, or you live in a modern tribe, such as a corporation, all of us are part of this culture scape. In other words, the world that we exist in is really a world that is happening cognitively in our minds based on beliefs, rituals, culture, social indoctrination, and what our mom and our dad and our media and our priest and our teachers and our preachers tell us to be, do, and think. That's the culture scape. But we don't see that because like a fish swimming in water, we don't realize that the rules in which we live life are not necessarily true for everyone else. They're only true for us because of our conditioning. Now, the problem with this culture scape is that many people believe it's real, and thus they become a victim of the culture scape. The things that happen to them, a breakup, a business failure, being hospitalized, severely influence them. The world happens to them. Now, the interesting thing is, Alan Watts said, none of this stuff is real. In fact, there's a famous lecture by Alan Watts. I'm going to play you a minute of that where he says this, there is no such thing as a thing. Nine to five is a thing. No such thing. Marriage, religion, God, mindfulness, none of these exist. They are simply ideas in our head. Listen to Alan explain it in his cool accent. And so what I would call a kind of a basic problem we've got to go through first is to understand that there are no such things as things. That is to say separate things or separate events. That that is only a way of talking. And if you can understand this, you're going to have no further problems. <laughs> I once asked a group of high school children, what do you mean by a thing? And first of all, they gave me all sorts of synonyms. They said, it's an object, which is simply another word for a thing. It doesn't tell you anything about what you mean by a thing. And finally, a very smart girl from Italy who was in the group said, a thing is a noun. And she was quite right. A noun isn't a part of nature, it's a part of speech. There are no nouns in the physical world. There are no separate things in the physical world either. See, the physical world is wiggly. The clouds, mountains, trees, people are all wiggly. And uh, only when human beings get working at things, they build buildings in straight lines and try and make out that the world isn't really wiggly. But here were we sitting in this room, all built on straight lines, but each one of us is as wiggly as all get out. So there's no such thing as a thing. Think about it. Everything that we often label a thing only exists because it is a noun in our heads. Now, this sounds philosophical, right? But what if modern science is now saying that's true? I want to introduce you to a really fascinating idea. So let me explain it this way. Our ears hear the sounds of the world around us, right? We hear the sounds outside us. But what if we could hear the sounds inside our body? Now, if you could hear the sounds inside your body, it would be really, really, really messy. You'd hear your heartbeat, you'd hear your lungs breathing, you'd hear um, your hormones going in all directions, you'd hear blood flowing through your body, you might hear your, your kidneys doing what kidneys do, and your liver doing what livers do, and your stomach juices churning. It would be messy, and you wouldn't be able to concentrate on anything else. And so what, how do we evolve? We evolve to listen to what's going on outside, but not to listen to what's going on inside. Or do we? 
Because one, scientists suggest that we do listen to what's going on inside. We just don't hear it as sounds. We hear it as emotion. Your emotions are governed by what's going on inside you. And then we give a label to these emotions, jealousy, anger, hate, joy, happiness. But it's nothing more than what's going on inside you. Now, as crazy as this sounds, I've got to share this with you. This is a picture of Tahiti. In Tahitian culture, there is no word for sadness. In fact, there's a famous book called On Emotions by a scientist called Lisa Feldman Barrett. And she says in our culture, meaning the US culture, we have sadness. But in Tahitian culture, they don't have that. Instead, they have a word whose closest translation would be the kind of fatigue you feel when you have the flu. <laughs> Imagine that. There is no sadness. Now, what she's saying is even deeper than this. What she's saying is that emotions are not a thing. Just as Alan Watts said, emotions are not a thing. In fact, there are only four different emotions. There is unpleasant, pleasant, arousal, or calm. Arousal, calm, pleasant, unpleasant. And everything we feel in the world that we give a label to is really the intersection of these four basic emotions which are based on the chemistry going on in our body. So check this out. This might be jealousy to American culture. To a different culture, they might label it different. You're feeling unpleasant, more, more unpleasant than pleasant, but still slightly aroused by an object someone else has, jealousy. This might be the emotions you feel on a first date. Arousal, you're feeling pleasant, a little bit of unpleasant there, you're wondering if you're doing things okay, and you're mostly jittery, so you're not so calm. All that's going on is these four emotions grow and shrink within our bodies, and then we give it a name, and that name defines how we experience it. Now, Lisa Barrett goes on to say this. She says, if you know the word for an emotion, if you hear the word often, then it becomes much more automatic, just like driving a car. It gets triggered more easily, and you can feel it more easily. In short, would we experience jealousy if there was no English word for jealousy? Would we experience hate if there was no word for hate? It's an interesting question to ask ourselves. But this idea of a thing not being a thing goes on to everything that we do in the world every construct of human society that we often give a name to. So, in this first stage of consciousness, the mistake that people make is that they associate who am I with a thing. Who am I is your vocation. I'm a lawyer. I'm a doctor. I'm a meditation instructor. Then they associate what do I desire with a thing. Well, I want love. I want wealth. Those are things that don't really exist in the real world. Then they associate, what do I know with a thing? I want to be peaceful. I want, um, I know that I am a kind person. I know that God has my side. But kindness, God, they don't exist. They are nothing more than labels that we have given things that we have created in the culture scape. You see how this works? Basically, like the ancient Indian said, we are living in an illusion, or maya. And, these, and when you go as deep into this philosophy, you start to see that illusion. And this is what happens next. You go into what is generally an awakening. You start to understand that this illusion is only there because you're blindly following the language and the culture of your forefathers and the media and the politicians and the newspapers and mom and dad. Now, this illusion is so, so, so pervasive that the words that you learn as a child determine what you see in life. So check this out. There was a study that showed that certain cultures cannot see colors the way we see them. So there was a famous podcast, and in the podcast they spoke about this phenomenon that this historian was studying, where in the ancient world there was no word for the color blue. And he asked, did people see blue 2,000 years ago? Because if you look at Homer's Iliad, right, which was written around 2,300 years ago, there is no mention of the color blue. The sea is referred to as the wine-dark sea, 
no mention of blue. You look at ancient Chinese texts, no mention of blue. So does blue exist? So he wanted to figure this out. So he went to this tribe called the Himba tribe in Namibia, and he showed them this television screen with these green squares. And can you see the blue square? Yes. Say yes if you can see the blue square. Yes. Well, guess what? The Himba people, they could not see the blue square. They couldn't pick it out. They have no word for the color blue. But they have over a dozen words for the color green. So when he showed the Himba people this slide, they could instantly see which square was a slightly off shade of green. Can you guys see the square with the off shade of green? <laughs> I like how you flip-flop, right? Yes, no. But the Himba people could instantly see that. Again, they have more words for the color green, less words for the color blue. Now, it's the same with Russian speakers. Russian speakers have two different words for the color blue. Any Russian speakers in the house? Okay, what is the shout out, the two Russian words for the color blue? Sini and Igalobloy, Loloy. <laughs> something and something. But Russians have two words for the color blue. Scientists show that Russians are 5% better at identifying shades of blue than Americans and other English speakers, right? So the words we get used to govern what we see in the world, which raises the question, bad emotions that we feel, are we simply feeling them because our parents gave that emotion a name? Do you really see something if you don't have a word for it? Now, when you start understanding this, you start to see that we exist in a world that is filled with bullshit rules or rules. And these rules govern so many things about how life is meant to work. And so I want to introduce you to another Zen philosopher. This guy has a different take on it. And his take allowed him to do some really amazing things in the world. Listen to this Zen philosopher. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you and you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. You guys know who that Zen philosopher is? Scream it out, right? That Zen philosopher so questioned the walls, the artificial walls of the world around us, he went to create things that you guys now carry in your pants, such as the iPhone, right? But the interesting thing is, look, listen to what he said. He said, you are told not to bash into the walls too much. But pretty soon you realize that all of these rules were made up by people no smarter than you, and you can question them, you can challenge them, you can build your own things that people can use. And that's where, at this stage of awakening, questioning starts entering your mind. But we are so trained as a culture to not question. How many of you here as kids, when you ask questions, you know, you know how kids go, they're like, why, 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 why? And, and your parents are always gonna say, because I told you so. <laughs> and so we're trained to not ask these questions. At level two, though, you start going back to that childhood nature of questioning. You start realizing the world is bendable. You don't like the nine to five, great. You start your own company or you introduce flexi time. You, you don't like religion, no problem. You join Mind Valley and just learn from spiritual teachers. <laughs> life can happen to you or life can happen from you. And at this world, at this level, life is emerging from you. You are creating the world as you want to see it. You don't like the university system, you create Mind Valley U. You. you don't like the way mobile phones work, you create the iPhone. Now, it does not have to be something as big as that. It could be the way you hack your education. It could be the way you start your business. It could be the way you, you told your parents that you were not going to blindly follow their fundamentalist religious ideas, even though they had been part of your family for 300 years. You create your own rules. And this is when this great awakening starts happening. So all of us have beliefs about the world. The thing about, the, about beliefs is this, right? Your beliefs are not you. We confuse our beliefs with who we are. Rather, your beliefs possess you. All your beliefs about the world are implanted in you by society, by media, by parents, by preachers, by teachers, by religion, by dogma, by culture. And you can pluck out those beliefs. And when you start doing that, 
you really start questioning the rules. Michael Beckwith said it best yesterday. He said this, the world as you see it is an artifact of a previously held point of view. Your eyes are always looking at the past. Everything we see in this room, in, as we get out of this room, as we go home, as we survive in the world, as we go to our jobs, it's looking at artifacts of the past. And at this level, the level of awakening, you come to see that. And so you're constantly thinking about how can you create a new world that suits what you, how you want to live life. And so you know that thing about how thoughts create reality? At this point, it's true. And you know, it's not the mumbo jumbo version of your mind creating reality, not that that's not real. Here your thoughts are actually creating reality because you are questioning the cognitive plane. You are questioning the rules and the assumptions and the cultures and the beliefs that we hold on to so tightly thinking they are real. Many of these have hit their expiration date, but people still leave it, leave it in their fridge like sour milk. Now what you're doing is opening the refrigerator door, looking at what rules, what beliefs have hit that expiration date and discarding it, and then creating your own stuff to put in that refrigerator. Now, we come to the three questions. Who am I? What do I desire? What do I know? And you find that how you answer these questions is really, really, really different. Who am I? You may no longer be a traditional vocation. You may decide that you are a philosopher mystic, or you are a tribe builder engineer. You're creating your own vocations. What do I desire? Often you desire things that other people do not desire because they, their desires are coming from this rule book of the culture scape. You have your three most important questions. You have your life book. You want to create a new life for yourself. But the biggest question that really, really, really gets addressed when you hit this level is what do I know? What do I know? Alan Watts suggests an exercise. He calls it the two list. He says, make a list, and please do this when you get home. Make a list of everything that you know because you experienced it. And then make a list of everything that you know because someone told you it was true. It's a really interesting exercise because pretty soon you understand that so many things that you think are true are only true because someone told you they were true. Somebody told you that you need to own a car. Somebody told you that you need to send your kids to school. Somebody told you that your body is gonna be prone to aging. Somebody told you that obesity was in your genetics. What is it that you know that is true because you experienced it directly? And what do you know is true because you were programmed and you had a belief installed in you? That is level two.